I mean, you want to let everyone in and I can start sharing my screen, please. Yeah. Sorry. Are you? Oh, and then, oh. Okay, they're coming. <laughs> Aloha Nui, everybody. Mahalo for joining us this morning as you guys are all getting connected to your Zooms. <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna get started. Aloha my kako. Welcome to the first installment of our Bahiku Puna Star Trip Sarah series. We're just gonna kick off this morning um, with a brief introduction to our collective. Um, so the Kali'u Kapa'akai Collective is a community of practice of advocates in Bahiku Puna Stewardship that was created from the need to organize our shared ideas, resources, and strategies to build capacity and take collective action in safeguarding Hawaii's Bahiku Puna. The collective's purpose is to strengthen Bahiku Puna Stewardship through collaboration and collective efforts. Um, our vision is empowered communities, restoring, re reinvigorating, and starting Hawaii's Bahiku Puna. Our mission is to collectively activate and fulfill our kuleana to protect Hawaii's wahiku puna and ike kupuna. Um, our call to action is to build a system that truly protects wahiku puna and empowers communities, empowers communities and reconcept reconceptualize our need to reconceptualize cultural resource management as wahiku puna stewardship. Hey, um, mahalo Amber for um, giving a brief overview of um, the collective. Um, so again, mahalo everyone for joining us this morning and kicking off the first of our Vahikupuna Stewardship Share Series. Um, I'm Kalanali Akuili. I'm from Kihei, Maui, and I um, work with Kali the Kali'o Kapa'akai Collective. And um, I'm, who was just talking before me was Amber Souza. Um, yeah, so this, we're really excited to kick this off this series off um, with the theme Kui Kamana. Um, so Kui Kamana is an olala no eyal that um, you can see on the side right here that translates to like the one from who received what he learned. So the child who behaves like those who rear him. So mana refers to that chewed food that uh, like a manu, um, manu or uh, that you give and you feed a child. So what this whole series is really trying to encompass is the sentiments of kui kamana and the way that we can highlight the transfer of knowledge from one generation to the next and serving as a reminder of the many ways we um, impart lessons and can have and continue to feed the young keiki um, when they're fed and raised by that of the kupuna. And in doing so, we become in the likeness of these kupuna, of these kumu, of these people. And um, what we're highlighting too is the places that have reared us. Um, so the Vahi Kupuna Stewardship Series really aims to feature a panel of multi-generational speakers that will sh share stories of their experiences passed down to them um, that ground them to these Vahi Kupuna, that ground them to these ancestral places. And in these ways, we become the embodiment of these kupuna and we, we become carriers of these knowledge sets. And um, what's really important that um, now we find us in the time and more so the privileged kuleana is to understand how then do we try to um, pass on and continue the transfer of knowledge. Um, so today we're um, so fortunate and um, really excited to have um, our two speakers, Auntie Kaleo. Um, so and Ke, um, Ke Po'o. So Auntie Kaleo was born in Konahema. Um, she was raised in the Ahupua'a Waipuna Ula. Um, her Ohana can trace her genealogy back for generations from Na Po'opo'o to Kealia in Konahema. Um, she's volunteers and is associated with a plethora of organizations. Um, some are the Ahavahine, Koa Ike, Ala Kakahiaka um, Trail Association, or Kalamai Ala Kahakai Trail Association and Partnership for the National Trail System. Um, 
Auntie Kaleo is a valued member of our Kali'o Kapa'akai's collective's Papa Kaheka. So our Papa Kaheka is our Kupuna Council. Um, she's a strong advocate for the protection of our Vahi Kupuna and continues to lend her time and expertise to the preservation of our sacred places. Um, and then alongside her, we also have Ke Po'o. Um, Ke Po'o Keli Ipa'akaua um, was born in Alia Pa'akai O'ahu, um, currently resides in Honolululi. Um, Ke Po'o got his BA and Ike Hawaii, Olalo Hawaii, recently his MA and Ike Hawaii, and is also a PhD, um, a student in the PhD program for urban regional um, and planning at the UH Manoa. Um, he's involved in the same of uh, various um, Vahikupuna stewardship projects across the Pai Aina from Hawaii to Papahana Mokuakea. Um, and his, he's, yeah, if ever you need Kokoa or want to talk to somebody about Mahele documents, Kepo is a guy. <laughs> um, so he has a, a strong background and passions with ethno-historical research pertaining to Aina, Aina systems, historical maps, and Mahele. Um, and I will leave the rest, um, rest of their introductions to themselves because, you know, today is really about um, taking the time to share space with each other and just, um, you know, getting to start to um, recognize the Pilina and as Auntie Kaleo told me this morning, um, the familiarities we have with one another. Um, so I'm sure that I'll pass it over to Auntie Kaleo and Kipo um, so we can become familiar with them and they to us. Um, so mahalo nui. Uh, mahalo e Amber e Kalena for setting us off. Mahalo nui akakwo for joining us. Uh, I guess before I begin, start us off with, with a real quick kind uh, pule here. Uh, if we could, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, fast one. Me pule kakwo. Ina akwo, na umu akwo, na ligi, na kupuna. Mai, mai kai kina kala, i kana poa, na i hola niku. Malu nui au ko no ko malama ana ya ma ko ma kia wawa ki au malu no kia hui ana ka ko mea e kuka kuka a pilia na i mea ka ko yala ka ihia e oko a e ya ka ko e yala ka i na mamo o kwa hope a mele mahalo a mama wano yeah mahalo everybody um. Very happy and honored to be here uh, to present uh, again alongside Auntie Kaleo, who is my actual auntie. We are related um, through my my dad's side, both chasing back to Konahema. And um, yeah, mahalo um, I won't waste any more time speaking about myself anymore here. Let me get my slides going. Just a moment, all the technical difficulties with Zoom and whatnot. Okay, can everybody see my... My slides here. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> yeah, hello, my name is Kipo. I'm Kili Ipaakawa. Uh, as mentioned, I've in, been in school, continue to be in school, um, currently in a PhD program. I'm not going to talk about any kind of academia stuff here today. I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the things that are more important <clears throat> and the people who are more important. Um, and helping to guide us as we go along this approach to like how we malama, um, and whatnot. And for me, that has come primarily through the realm of academia and trying to see whatever I can while I have the, the time um, and the privilege of being able to do so. What, what can I do to bring that back to you know, everyone else who, who doesn't have all this time to spend in school like that? And so, um, Primarily what I'm gonna talk about are a lot of the people in my family um, who have influenced me um, talk about Kumu that I've had throughout the years and the places that have been shared with me as well. Um, full disclaimer, I don't consider myself to be someone that has had a whole bunch of like really in-depth detail oihana or different kuleana that have been passed down in an unbroken chain from one generation to the next. As I know it's the case for so many of us, um, <laughs> there, there's been a lot of things that have dissociated us from Aina, um, from different practices, from our own language even, that has made such transmission of this knowledge um, 
lot more challenging. And so I felt that maybe it would be more helpful for me to speak to that today and show like what, what do we have? And it's different for every single one of us. And so this is primarily um, what I've been able to experience here. And so <clears throat> uh, crucial to all of that, of course, is Ohana and is Mo'oku Avao. And so fittingly, it begins uh, in more of the shorter term with my great grandma, um, Alice Kerema'i. Um, Kauinui is her married name. That's her with my great grandpa, Samuel Kauinui. And um, I credit her first and foremost with me being on this path um, and going through academia and going through the college system and learning my language and learning my culture through other halo as well outside of the university. Um, it was her who really started to instill the importance of Hawaiian culture and history into her mo'opuna. Uh, thankfully, one of those was my mom. There, there's a lot of lessons that she would share. Um, when my mom was just a kid and, and dropping little things to her, or not, not really little things, but telling her stuff like, oh yeah, did you know that we had a queen? Um, her name was the Lu'o Kalani. And did you know all of these, she'd share all these different mo'olelo that she had about uh, in different minute and the trails I would walk down She'd point them out to my mom while sitting by the window at night from their home in Papa Kolea. Um, my mom would recount even seeing um, torchlit trails at night as my grandma would be telling these stories to her. And so these, these resounded um, <clears throat> in a lot of ways that my mom didn't anticipate at the time as a child. Uh, she thought like, okay, that's cool. I'm going to go outside and play now. But then years later, she realized that um, those, those lessons from my great grandma really, really uh, sank, uh, sat deep within my mom's now. And it was something that she began to um, really hold dear and always felt that she wanted this to be something that would pass on to her kids. And so um, this, this is my mom. And that, that, that guy over there with the face wrapped up is me. You can tell, because you can see the matching beautiful brown eyes. I'm joking. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this is my mom, Kiala Norman. And uh, from before I was born, she had done so much to, she served primarily as my, my first humu. Um, she's the one who taught me, like, <laughs> I'm, I love Mahele documents, I love maps, and uh, my master's research has been um, in a big part trying to piece together puzzles of what the uh, mid 18th, mid 1800s uh, Wayaba looked like at the time. So kind of a crazy puzzle as I could describe. Um, it's, it's with the exception that like most puzzles, most jigsaw puzzles that you buy, you have like, you know how many pieces come in the, the set, you know what kind of picture you're building to, um, the puzzles are predetermined size cut and whatnot. This this one was totally different in that like, you didn't even know how many pieces I had, what size or shape they were, how they'd fit in. And so you're trying to figure out all these different aspects to the puzzle. In the meantime, why do I bring this all up? Mom's the first one who got me um, interested in, in puzzles and learning and problem solving. Um, when she was pregnant with me, she began reading to me, playing classical music and whatnot. And you know, eventually I would go on to even play in the orchestra um, in high school, uh, playing bass, uh, probably in part because of her influence there and the others who influenced that as well. But uh, as much as possible, she made sure that we had as much time to spend with our grandparents as we could which was challenging at the time. As mentioned in my bio, I was born in Alia Pa'akai. Um, what that means is I was born in Tripler Hospital. <laughs> my dad from South Kona, um, he was in the Air Force at the time. And so that's why I was born in, in that big hospital over there about two years after we moved um, pretty far away uh, from South Kona, <laughs> all the way to Florida. And uh, well, they made it a point to bring us back each time whenever we could. And um, so lessons that I take there that, you know, mom, <clears throat> tell me the importance of family and keeping those connections to family, doing what you could to make sure that generations after you can continue to have those people you know, build those relationships and whatnot. So you can learn a lot of these lessons as her great grandma had instilled in her. And so this is some of my ohana, Auntie Kaleo knows well, because this is her ohana too. Um, really, really huge influences on me. Um, my grandma, Virginia, Ipa Akawa and her husband, my grandpa, um, Joseph Kili Ipa Akawa, um, also carries that name, Kipo'o. And um, so they live in South Kona, <clears throat> Kei and Honaunau. Um, and 
a lot of times when we've had discussions about Aina, like what was our first experience with Aina, my first experience that I can recall would be going to this house, um, this Aina over there, that, that is family Aina that has remained in the Ohana for generations. Um, one of the very few places uh, in my Ohana, both on my mom and my dad's side, that we maintain um, until this day. And <clears throat> my memories of going there are of you know, climbing up and down different trees in the backyard, getting into trouble, eating mangoes, picking um, mac nuts and whatnot too. And so as I was young, I thought that like maybe what, like what am I really learning from this? Is like, oh, grandma and grandpa's house is cool and it's fun and there's a great beach and I love them. And, you know, grandma loves music, loves playing music and stuff that within me too. Um, it's the reason why I, I taught myself music in fourth grade is so that I could go back on a, and play music with her. And part of the reason why I joined the orchestra in um, seventh grade and continued through high school was so that I could learn how to play bass. So I can go back and specifically play bass for grandma because it seemed like, well, not everybody play bass. Grandma needs a bass player because, you know, she liked her music. So then what lessons did I really get from that? Was, um, I realize now was that it, realized, it helped me to really appreciate what it means to have family, I know. Uh, to really have that connection, to have these stories associated with these places. Um, my grandma helped me to really appreciate mele and uh, to understand all the ike that is transmitted through mele as has been done for hundreds and hundreds of generations before any of this was reported in written format as we rely upon heavily within academia today. And um, so for that, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for my mom who would continue to bring me out there to make sure that I had time to spend with them. Um, that is not me in the, the picture on the left. That is actually my nephew. Uh, he looks like a big boy there, but he's actually a lot bigger right now. I, I, I swear that boy is like taller than me and probably like twice my weight and whatnot. He could probably pick me up with one hand. Um, and that's my grandma. And the, on the right side is my grandma and her sisters. And this is a scene that I have not seen in years for um, multiple reasons. Uh, part of it is because unfortunately, more fortunately, it's part of the natural cycle. As you know, um, you know, some of us continue on to be Kupuna and Aumakua in different ways. And then many of her sisters are still alive today too though, but then of course other realities like the pandemic makes it a lot more difficult to reconnect in this way. I hope that I can see her this month, but I don't know that I will. Um, she will be 90 years old this month. But given <clears throat> the recent rising cases, I don't know that I, as someone from Oahu, will want to go to an endanger in that way by potentially exposing her to any kind of sickness. But yeah, that's my grams. <laughs> and this is my other grandma. Um, well, and many of her siblings. This is my mom's mom. Um, so I kind of positioned the text box as I could uh, to try to point her out a little bit more easily. So kind of in the center. So the beautiful kupuna of all of these beautiful kupuna over there in the red dress with the lay on is my grandma, uh, Kahili Marmin. And on the far left is her sister, right, Auntie Kaonohi. And um, something that I really learned from each of them is uh, the importance of continuing to remember places and to remember the names of places and to continue to share the stories and the genealogical connections that we have to each other and to these places. And so <clears throat> my grandma's side is from uh, this island on Oahu, uh, which is to Kalia within Waikiki, uh, currently heavily, heavily developed, but I'll never forget um, ways that my grandma opened up this place for me to see it through a different lens by taking us all across um, what could easily be regarded as, you know, hotel infested beaches, and, super urban developed areas, which she tell us the story. She tells the names of these different areas. And these are like down to um, smaller than Ili names, but um, even just like really localized areas, like places like Kabehebehe and not. And she tell us where not only she would go swimming as a child, but where different ancestors who were alive, even like in Talakawa era, um, where they resided, what they did there. Um, took us to Aina that was family Aina that, um, it's no longer in our possession um, right now with the, where the wave Waikiki used to be, I guess, is, is actually where 
Um, each of these kupuna were born with the exception of my auntie Kaano, who was the youngest one, and so they had already moved from that property somewhere else. But every every other um, other one of my grandma's siblings was born there. And it's through these two kupuna, um, as well as my mom, uh, who brought me into being more actively engaged in the kuleana to malamaiwi kupuna. And so auntie Kaano, he had started to get involved a lot um, the early 2000s, perhaps a little earlier. Uh, and then my grandma would get involved with her. Of course, she brought my mom in. And then um, I was called back in many different ways from where I was originally going to school in Arizona. It was definitely meant for me to be, to return here and to own all this kuleana. Um, actually, yeah, let's grab my, thank you again, everybody, for this little short version of uh, Kipo'o's abbreviated life history. Um, yeah, so around 2002 is, is when I came back, um, called back for like Kuleana to Malamayibi Kupuna and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> as years went on, um, different things happened in my life around 2007. My dad had passed away. Um, a year after that, his dad had followed him. And so to this day, I'm the only one with the name Kipo'o that's still alive. And it still carries that. Um, I missed them. I still miss them. I still wish that there were different ways that I could communicate with them and ask them different questions. But I found um, really that there are ways that that can still happen. Um, I remember when I was young, dad told me there was this person who came by the house to talk story with my grandpa. And he's like, oh, okay, that's cool. He's like, yeah, who, who is that? He's like, oh, his name is... Um, Kepa Mali, uh, and it was like, okay, I, I, I didn't know anything about who, who this was at the time, but I didn't, I didn't realize that Makala Kepa, um, you know, this researcher who does a lot of these ethnographies, talks to all these different people, and so um, fortunately it was um, my grandpa he was one of them that he interviewed, and from that interview, I've been able to continue conversations with my grandpa and get answers to a lot of different questions or, or find ways to answer questions. Um, that I've had for him, and they've showed up in, in many other different ways as well. All that to say, like when they, they passed, it was a very difficult time for me. Um, there was a lot of healing uh, that I needed, and thankfully, again, my mom knew exactly uh, what the cure would be for that. As we all know, some therapy can do wonders, and so I'm very thankful for my uncle, Alapaki Luke, who has been helping different ohana in uh, Kahana, on this island on Oahu. And so my mom decided to take me out there um, to see if that would, would heal me at all. And it, it definitely did. Um, I was very surprised on that first visit out there to see my cousin Kaipoi um, over there, which one of the last places I expected to see him. This is part of our Kona Ohana from Hawaii Island. And so I was like, oh, Poi, what are you, what are you doing over here at this place this time? And he ended up also happening to wear um, a t-shirt that we had made uh, with my grandpa, pictures of my grandpa on there and um, his name on there that was made at the time of the funeral. And so I was like, oh, uh, looks like I was definitely meant to to be in this place at this time right now. And, and sure was. Um, I've had the honor and, and privilege of being able to kokua out in Kahana for some years. We'd go out there regularly every weekend, uh, learn the importance of sustainability of Kulikalima Ilalo. And in doing so, as you reach down and, and work the land, you're also touching that and uh, um, making these relationships that feed you and that place hoping to bring it to life. And so a lot of the pina that I've made with people have had also lasting impacts on myself through the Aina itself. I, I had a new goal in mind of like, oh, I think this is what I want to do with my life. I want to I wanna make my own lo'i kalo and whatnot. And, and, and then my mom encouraged me, like, maybe I should go back into school. And it's, like, it's always been something that I was good at. Um, always been a tutor from like a young age. And she's like, this is maybe what you need to do. And you can do that through, uh, you know, in, in ways that are more directly pertinent to your people. When I first went to school, it was for uh, the purpose of becoming a fighter pilot. Uh, so <laughs> totally different path than I'm on now. But um, going to Kahana helped me to reconnect to not just Aina, but in connect me to um, healthy pathways through the university system as well. Um, my 
uncle's partner at the time, Pearl Wu, helped connect me to Mehana Hind, who was working as a counselor um, through UH, and they both got me started on my academic journey through LCC. In the meantime, continued to go to this place, learn from Uncle Apaki, learn from Uncle Nana Gorai, you see over there on the left. <clears throat> and then, and I also met this man out there too, uh, the one, the only, the infamous Uncle Makanani. And um, this is exactly as I met him out there. And uh, Antique Kaleo noticed because I, I got busted when I first logged on to it. I normally have my Star Wars like virtual background because I'm a total Star Wars door. But uh, I, I think it's kind of fitting to bring up here too because I feel like when I first met Uncle Maka, like it, it was kind of like when Luke met Obi-Wan for the first time in, in like episode four, right? And you're talking about this guy, Ben Kenobi. So Luke, Luke knows this, this old person, this kupuna as like, you know, maybe a fairly eccentric person and whatnot, but just as, as some guy, Ben Kenobi. And that, that's what Uncle Maka was at first to me. I, I didn't I had no idea his background, his knowledge, the depth of that game and whatnot. So I had no idea this was actually, you know, a master Jedi of sorts when it comes to our community and the insights and the impact that he's had. And so I learned many things from him. I, I had I knew nothing about his involvement with Koho Olave or with the Hopulea or anything else. But then I, I would soon learn uh, very quickly is I'd go out every weekend, sometimes more than every weekend uh, at the time Uncle Mako was heavily involved out there. And so I worked really closely with him, uh, cutting grass, cutting how. He taught me how to use a chainsaw. He taught me how to throw a net. Um, and he taught me many other lessons too. One, I'll, I'll just share one. I know a lot of people know him have learned so much from him as well and from others. And I remember um, in Timor, we were on Ho'olave too. He was telling me like, oh, hey, Paul, do you have an apu? <clears throat> and so, like, oh no, I, I don't say, like, oh, you know, maybe you should make one. But if you had one apu, you made from Ho'olave. I was like, oh, wow, that would be really cool. And it's, you know, like, you know, no more any new growing over there or anything. And he's like, oh, here, he hands me one new, an old one, and his, his Leatherman, you know, his pocket knife, and just, like, leaves me to it. It's like, okay, go ahead, go figure it out. Try, try to make one. It's like, okay, all right. So I was sitting over there on the stand by the Zodi shed that, you know, we had just built Pohaku walls for. And um, I cut open a new, and it, it's really old. Uh, the inside of the shell is all like um, rotten and black. And it's like, oh, every time I heard or seen people making apu ava, like the thing don't look like this. Like, oh, maybe maybe I gotta find one other one. I told my uncle, oh, I don't, I don't think this one any good. I think I gotta try find one other one. So he, he kind of look at me, look around, like, okay, here's another one. I worked through that new same thing. Thing looked really old, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what am I learn? Oh, I hope I can find a good one. And then um, I look at the rest of them from the outside. They all look pretty much the same. And then, of course, at this point, I, I know the whole time, even though he's silent, he's, I know he's watching me and <laughs> like, trying to see if I'm going to figure out what it is I really need to learn here and what that lesson was. was like, yeah, you know what? Maybe these aren't the most pretty new. Um, but like you see any of the trees around there? And I knew, I knew that too. There are no new, you don't know Kumulao new in Akiwawa, if they are on the island, if you're like hike 16 miles across, and then maybe you can go find yourself one fresh new that way. But otherwise, I see that the lesson was like, here, here's the resources that you have. What are you going to make of it? Are these really, um, what do you call it? Decrepit, degraded, um, new, or, or is it an apple? Can you make something from this? And, um, I did, so I made my, my opuni, the first one I've ever made. Um, it was from <laughs> multiple different new that I maybe kind of disregarded at first, but then was able to find the value in, which was a huge lesson that stuck with me throughout. And that lesson, again, is no matter how rough something might look, no matter how much it might seem like it's not worth it, there is something that's always worth it, especially when it comes to Aina. And that ended up really um, applying itself, that lesson, um, to my work in you know, focusing on Waiava to feel like Eva on Oahu and Oahu in general. 
a lot of times it is kind of discarded as a lost cause or a waste. Like there's nothing more that can be done here. It's so heavily developed. It's so urbanized. What value can we find in these places? And then especially when you look at Fu'olo, people think like, oh, but the military's in there. It's so polluted. But like, what are we going to do with it? Like, you know, maybe we better find something else too. And myself at the time too, Burst was seeking students from EVA at Leeward Community College across the mountain to Kahana to be able to engage in activities like Mala Ma'ina. But in lessons like this help me to identify like, no, no, this is a place worth investing in. This is a, a place worth knowing and loving and revitalizing. And like, really when we think that we don't want to do all the restoration work here in the Aina, it's actually the Aina that's restoring us. And so these are a lot of the lessons that I got from Uncle Maka. One of, of so many, there's, there's a lot of lessons I got from one lesson of many, many lessons, as you know, the man is full of them. And so again, mahalo Uncle Maka. Um, as I continued along <clears throat> my academic journey, I had the pleasure of meeting these two, Aloha Kelly, nice to see you on here in Kalamai. I, I don't, I've been, I spent all night trying to find all kinds of good pictures of us who I realized I didn't have any pictures of myself and, and Kelly on my phone or other things. I think, I know we have pictures together with some of us. Anyways, 2014, I met her and Kung Kekuewa. Um, Kung Kekuewa I've actually, actually known um, from before from around 2005 and so we were both in the Halimuas. First time I met him and then had uh, <clears throat> interacted with him in different ways as, uh, as a descendant himself, our family in, in consultation on projects that involved Kamehameha schools, which at the time he was responsible for uh, talking with descendants on any projects that Kamehameha was involved with, uh, where the Kupuna were impacted. In 2014, while I was, um, studying for my undergrad degrees. Then um, he mentioned this program, uh, the Malama in the Field School, which is a sister program to our Wahipukuna internship program, run through our nonprofit, Hude Awapa'a. And uh, this program uh, takes a place-based, culture-based approach to really grounding students in Hawaiian cultural knowledge and values while introducing them to introductory techniques for conducting ethno-historical research. We're doing um, archeological survey, uh, emphasize survey. We don't we don't do digging or anything. Everyone always asks like, oh, what is it? archaeology, you dig everything up. Like, no, we do the opposite thing here. But then also um, conducting responsible ethnographic interviews, as we call it at the time. And now we use the term oral histories in order to really contribute to a place and to understand like how to um, drive your research questions, not from your own interest or what you think it is that you want to research, but to really talk with the kuba'aina of place and see what their needs are and how you can fit in to what it is that they need to do. And so they really helped to establish that foundation for me, which has been the basis for all the work that I do um, within school, um, outside of school, as a part of the Kalu Collective and as a part of Kuleawapa'a. And so there have been really, really huge influences there in ways that helped me to tie together a lot of the lessons that have been ingrained in me as a child from when <clears throat> before I was born and after I was born, my mom was raising me with puzzles, sharing with me the stories of her great grandma um, as, and the lessons that continued through me as I you know, spent time with my own grandparents on their own Aina um, and been able to spend time with Kupa Aina and Kupuna of other Aina such as that in Kohana and at every other place that I've been in. I had the privilege of, of visiting with and learning from um, through this Wahipukuna internship program is I now serve as an instructor for the program. And so they helped to get me on that path there. And so Amber was very thoughtful in providing us with some uh, guiding questions to help us in this presentation, which honestly, I'd say was pretty overwhelmed at first when first I said do this. It seems like a, a broad <clears throat> area to cover, but one of the questions that um, she posed to help guide us is like, you know, what is a joyful kuleana that we have? Um, and also, how, what is it that we do to try and ensure that this knowledge is, it continues on for, for other generations? And I gotta say for me, that is this program, that Bahipukuna Internship Program, which through its sister program is how I first got involved. Now I, I get to participate as an instructor and uh, help to guide other um, homana and by guidance, like the, the, 
some of them call me Kumu and whatnot. And it's like, that's a Kuliana that they view me as, and that's a Kuliana I'm going to fulfill to them. And the way that I see myself most effectively fulfilling that Kuliana is to not sit and talk at people and lecture at them, but to have discussions to facilitate their own learning so that they can be the ones who can go and in turn teach themselves more, um, take this whatever approaches that we have back to their own communities to strengthen what they do. And so this is the highlight of my year. Every year is being able to participate in this program. Picture here is our most recent cohort, um, 2021. Uh, we were focused out in Hamakua, I know Pa'awilo and whatnot. We got to work with Huimalama Kiala Uyili. Um, for the first time, uh, we had kind of a pre-selected group to participate and it was such an honor. Um, the, Many, most of them are Kupa'aina of that place, have genealogical connections to that area. And every day they actively work to hold all of that place and to really restore um, themselves, the community and the Aina. And I seen there a thriving community that is really subsistent and feeding each other through Ike, through literal food, as well as like, they, they hand out, like, they'll be doing, um, I don't know what you call it, not food drives, but you know, they, they say handing out food to Kukuna and whoever else. And they, I wish I could have some of that food too. It looks mean. Like they, they, they're not putting out any just any kind of food. Like they say it's top shelf action. Um, but yeah, anyways, this, this is just our latest cohort. Um, Amber and Kalena, who are on with us now and, and currently working with us, have come through this program also in 2019 when we were in Waipa and Hawaii. And um, so yeah, I guess getting the question, how do I ensure that this can go on? Well, I can't ensure that everything gets transmitted. But one, one small thing that I see myself doing is at least working through this program to help facilitate others learning, to find other ways to reconnect with um, their own aina, their own kupuna, if um, they don't have those connections already to um, connect other ways that you can. Uh, thankfully, we are, Fortunate as points have such a repository of knowledge recorded in written form uh, through different the new pepa, through books that some of our Kanaka scholars have written. We have their leo recorded in different recordings you find in Kaleo Hawaii, um, now available online, um, and even recordings in uh, Bishop Museum and through works as other people have done as well. And so part of what I like to try to facilitate is connecting Pomana to these resources as well. Because if they didn't have um, super in-depth knowledge and practices passed down from one generation to another to guide them and maybe this way they can find those practices that their ohana had at one time carried out and of course we always have the living ohana today who can guide us through so much of this as well um, it's been really such an honor to be able to talk story two weekends in a row with Auntie Kaleo Pike again my real auntie I've learned so much from her as well. I've learned um, about some practices that she has done and continued within our ohana, um, along with other kuleana that we share in other ways, um, and helping to malama yuri kupuna. And she's done you know, this amazing work to protect kupuna across the paiaina, to really kind of straighten up the inventory over there and return so many of the kupuna that were being physically held in Shifti's own repository back to the Aina from which they came from, from which they were born, to which they will return and then removed. And she has facilitated the return of so many of them back to that Aina. All that to say, um, this is my last slide there. Mahalo, everybody. And would like to turn this over then to Andy Kaleo. Mahalo, everybody, for bearing with me on this little talk story. Well, thank you, Kipo, because that's sort of what we were uh, envisioning our series today was to journey, yeah, through the generations. And Kipo pretty much nailed his journey through the generations. And it's important, I think, for all of us, whether we be young, keiki, we be young adults, or we be kupuna, we must all think about what that journey means to us because journeying through the generations is not just your mokuauhau. It is actually learning experiential knowledge 
through these people who came before us so that we can pass on this knowledge to the next generation. It's very hard when you don't have a full bowl to present to the next generation. So we have to learn how to fill up our bowl with all these experiences, all the, like Paul said, meeting Uncle Maka and with the coconuts and trying to find the apu. There was a lesson there, but it had to come from him experiencing it and learning it. And then he can pass it on for other people to share in that experience. And he was able to take that and apply it to land, the aina. Yes, some lands people disregard as insignificant. It is useless. It's not good for anything, but it is. We just haven't had the maka to look at it and see it, absorb it, connect to it. So for me, journeying through the generation started before I was born, of course, through generations before me. And it was, I believe, I would like to say it was my dad. Of course, I was his favorite. We had four siblings, but he took a shining to me. And I think it was because I was there to listen and to hear and to learn. He would allow me to go to places and meet people that I had no idea why until I was older. And I was the only one who got to go. So many times he would take me to Okina Beach. And he would be out there fishing and he would be spear diving and I would be sitting on the beach all by my lonesome self, you know, because only he and I went and he would swim across the bay. Back and forth, man, we took him hours, right? But it gave me the opportunity to talk to the, the old folks that were there. They took me under their wing as well. <laughs> Because they said, oh, poor thing, that girl over there sitting down waiting for her papa. <laughs> and, but when my father came in, he had fish. He always offered fish, you know, as um, because he there was only two fish that he could really take home, manini and pakui kui. Be, those are the only two fish he was allowed to bring home because that's the fish we ate. Everything else he gave away. But during that time, and, and I learned from that time what I should be doing is listening to what they were asking. What are the questions they were asking? So sure enough, when through my journey in life, I would talk to the kupuna. The first question they would ask me is, where are you from? Then they would ask me, who is your ohana? Then they would keep going and going and going until they could find a place where we connected. And once we reached that place of connection, it was like we were friends forever or we knew each other forever, but it was that process. So therefore, that familiarity through the generations. And I had that conversation with Uncle Eddie, Kanana. He came to one of our classes uh, for Hawaiian nutrition. And he talked and he looked at me and he goes, hmm, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from South Kona. He goes, ah, okay. Who's your ohana? So I named my ohana. And he tells me, those names are familiar to me. And I said, okay. And then we started on a journey of discovering. When we started talking, I could name places down at Milo Lee that he grew up knowing, the families that he grew up knowing. So there was an instant connection between us. It became so strong and so solid that when we walked from um, the palace, Iolani Palace up to Mauna Allah, I don't know if you folks remember that long march, everyone did. He had all of his haumana that were there and I just went up to say, hi, uncle, how are you? And he said, Kaleo, 
he took my arm and he says, you are going with me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have my sisters, I have my keiki, but no, I had to desert them. They had to be on their own and I had to walk. And I was walking in the front with Uncle Eddie with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and I know a Thompson, you know, the trustees for the estate, all these dignitaries in the front. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? But we walked and at the very last minute, he asked me, can you please take off, help me take off my shoes. I need to walk there and feel the aina. And so here I am helping him take off his shoes, carry his shoes, walk him into Mauna Allah. And I said, what is this lesson that I'm supposed to learn here today? <laughs> because I am sure my family's on the other end going, look at her. She deserted us. She went with, I don't know who. But it was that connection that we had made at that very beginning that said to him, I can trust this girl with my life because we are family. And that's the same with our Aina. We need to connect. And every piece that we connect, that enables us to have Kuliana to that place. And that is what we can take and carry on. There are many times when this generational ties seem broken. They seem like the last of the last whoever has this property is gone, the last. It's not so. The Kuleana stays with the land. There might be other stewards for that land, but the Kuleana remains the same. That is what we must pass on to the next generation. Not necessarily okay, my grandparents sold this property. I no longer have a connection to this property. Not so. My great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, great-grandmother and grandmother are buried on Kamehameha School's property. I have never felt that I could not go and pay respects to them or to be watchful of what's happening around there. And it got to a point where Kamehameha schools were going to lease out the property that my grandmother and great-grandmother's graves were on. And so I went in and I did a burial uh, registration for them. And it was through that registration that I was able to meet with Kamehameha schools uh, personally, talk to them. And what they did was far beyond what I expected. They said, you know, we're going to still lease this property, but they are going to put to every leasee that comes through that this two graves belongs to the Pike Ohana and they must help take care of these graves. So even though I reside on Oahu, I can be 100% guaranteed that those two graves will be forever looked after. And just recently, uh, we identified graves that are in Kealia town of Mauka and Kamehameha schools also surveyed out a piece of that portion to say that this portion will no longer be disturbed. This belongs to this Ohana. And I thought to myself, that is what we all can do so that we never get disconnected from our kupuna that have passed before us. Once again, journeying through this familiarity through the generations is something that never dies. And we must always uh, keep that, taking, taking our keiki to these lands. That's one step. Like Kepo'o, he goes to visit his grandparents. And I could see by the photo, the aunties, you know, Auntie Lehua Domingo. Yeah, Auntie Stella Grace, so Auntie Momi Gigi. I'm looking at them and I'm going, aha, I know them. That's the familiarity we need to take with us. We're just not standalone people in this journey. We are a collective of our past, our relationships to them, 
and then moving forward to instill that into the next generations to come. And it's having discussions like this that helps us to say, ah, we're not alone. You know, we may not have known this earlier. And, you know, talking about timeline, my father, though he knew many things, did not go back to school until he was in his late 50s. He always wanted to go and get a degree, um, a college degree, and it was just not possible until he was maybe about 58, 59 is when he finally went. And he passed away just a, maybe a year or two after he got his degree. But he made sure all of us went to college. We all got our degrees. But he never embraced his Hawaiian-ness until much later in his life. And the reason for that is when he was growing up, it was not okay to be Hawaiian. There was a stigma. You were considered lazy. You were considered a very negative connotation to say you're Hawaiian. So he wanted to shield us from that. But he never lost his connection to the people he grew up with, the, the customs that he knew. He never gave up on that. And in sly moments, he would pass it on to us, you know. But like in every family, it may only be one that takes up that charge. Like Kepo, he's the one chosen to take up the charge. In my family, I'm the one that's to chosen to take up that charge. And that's okay because you don't need a whole bunch in the one family, but you do need the one. And you need the one to make sure that if you need help, the rest of the ohana will help and participate. So when, what I'm trying to say is it's never too late, never too late to embrace your Hawaiian-ness and your, um, your ability to help you with your kuleana. It's never too late. You are able to do that and come into the picture at any time in your life until the day that you hala out and move on to the next. So, you know, I feel sometimes for those who feel that they are not worthy enough or they feel that they don't have the right they don't have the right to be in the circle. They don't know the language and they feel a barrier to that. They don't feel like they're not comfortable or they don't feel like they would be accepted into the circle because they don't have these skills. And I reach out to those people and say, you know, language should never divide us because spirit never cares about what language you speak. But think Hawaiian, think how our ancestors thought. That will translate to you into what you need, to what you can share to the next generation. The language, if you choose to speak it, you choose to learn it, it's up to you. But that never is a division or a divisive measure to keep our ohana, to keep our lahui separate from each other. And when we talk about joyful kuleana, at times, it can be very, very stressful. Right now, with our trail association, we went through some years of heavy, heavy negotiations, um, trying to get community to buy into, you know, the preservation protection. It, it seemed overwhelming. It seemed as though we would not be able to overcome the barriers. But we did. And we did so by reminding ourselves that in the most trying time, what is the goal? The goal was to save that land. And knowing that we did made the joyful, joyfulness of that kulian. We still have much to do. We still have much frustration to work out. But we can always hold in our hearts that that morsel, that, that kernel of truth 
that it's saved. And that brings us the joy that we need. And it will be for the generations to follow. And that in itself will be our joyful kuleana. I'm not saying to you not to be serious. But I am saying, if you cannot find joy in what you're doing, maybe that's not for you. Maybe it needs to go to someone else to carry that burden. Because there's nothing worse than trying to get others to help you with kuleana when you are not joyful and not happy about it. Because then you're not going to find too many volunteers who are going to come on the journey with you. So, you know, we have to make sure that that is what we're trying to do here. And we're trying to do with the collective. We're trying to do personally with Kipo and I with the Alakahakai Trail Association, with any of the associations that I'm with, is that if we cannot be joyful about what we do and the end result be joyful, then maybe that's not for us. And we need to take rid of our ego, get rid of the, the importance of self to say maybe it belongs to someone else, but I will help. I will help. But I may not be able to carry that initial burden, but I will help. And if we send that kind of message, I think that we, we as a Lahui will benefit because this not, does not apply to just Hawaiians. We sometimes forget that in our frustrations about how we have been suppressed and how our um, Hawaiian-ness has been suppressed, that we forget that there are those who do not have our cocoa who have such love for us and our ways and our people. We must not exclude them. We must embrace them as well. That is the old way. That is what we did. The Westerners did take advantage of that, but that's on them and not on us. So we must make it so that we follow the knowledge. You know, in fact, one time someone asked me, how can we do climate change? Climate change, you know, how, how do we do climate change? And how does this apply to today's discussion right here in this session? I gave them this answer. Our kupuna lived the solution. I said, do you understand what I just said? And the girl said, mm, I think so. I'm not real sure. So I gave her examples. And what I meant by that is that our ancestors lived the solution because they took care of the land. The land was the chief. The land was the master. We were but transient stewards that came across the land. We are not the solution. The land is the solution. Our ancestors knew that. The problem we have today with climate change and all the environmental challenges that we have is that we have to find a solution, not a solution, we have to find a means on how to bring their solution and make it applicable today. And that's the hard part. Everybody wants a big house. Everybody wants two, three cars. Everybody, but our ancestors didn't. They learned how to live with the land. They learned how to make a small imprint. In South Kona, it's documented that we could feed a million people. How did we do that? We did that with the land system. We built barriers on the, on the parts, on the mountains, so kept water from rushing down. We did this with the field system. And we were bountiful. We can do that again today, but we have to take care of our wahikupuna. We have to take care of our land. We have to find within ourselves ways to live with our land the way that our ancestors did. Because that worked. And I think that if we... And that's why I'm so very proud of the collective because it gives a space for people to talk and to 
share ideas on how we can come together and how we can save. And, and I don't mean just save and protect just for the sake of saving and protecting. How do we save, protect, and perpetuate these resources so it's not depleted for our generations to follow? So they don't have to go, hey, Tutu, I only hear the stories, but how come we cannot go to these places? Oh, I'm so sorry, but it's gone. Hmm. That should ring something true into ourselves to say, wait a minute. Let's hold the presses. Let's stop what we're doing. And let's evaluate how we can move forward in a more pono fashion. Yeah. How, how am I grounded? How, how did I ground myself through the experiences that I have? Long process. Because each experience taught me something different. So in my 70 years of existence, I have 70 years worth of experience that I can draw from. Yeah. But the beauty is I can now pass on some of this information to the next generation that they may not experience it, but when they do, they can remember Auntie Kaleo's words. Oh, remember now she said that. And they will make much more sense. And hopefully... Whatever I can share may help the next generation not to have to struggle through the process as severely as I did, as my father did, as his mother did, as her parents did. That maybe what I have learned, what I can pass on, can be something that will enable a quicker way of realization and you know to to say that i know so much no i only can speak from experience and uh, like i shared with uh, both amber and kalena earlier before we got on is the familiarity no build create relationships those relationships, create your relationship with your aina. If you live someplace where you were not born from, create a relationship with that aina. Create a relationship with the kupuna from that place. Create a relationship with a vast pool of people so that you can draw these different experiences, you can draw these different ideas so that you are not stuck. You know, I always say, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, when I talk about some of the agencies, I said, oh my goodness, forgive me, but I think they need a drastic enema. Flush it all out, get rid of all of the waste so that they can fill themselves up with new ideas and maybe better ideas. So, you know, I'm not going to really talk too much longer, except to say that if there's anything that I can share today in this series is in your life, journey through the generations, connect back with the people who came before you and definitely find a space to go and malama those who are coming. For me, I already have some one that I will pass the information on to. And that is my granddaughter. It was chosen for me. And that is the old way. When something or someone is chosen, not your choosing, she will learn all that I know. It will not pass to my son, my daughter, my nieces, my nephews, my siblings. It will be passed on to this particular child that when she, before she was born, I got the message, she will be the one. When she was born, there was a chant that came through a dream that specifically said, I am coming, Grammy, I am coming. I am coming to meet you. I am coming. I am your one. And to me, that's all I need to know. 
I get chicken skin every time, you know, I relate that story, but this is what we can do. All of us, find that one. Find that one that we can pass all this information on to so that it is not for now. And it's not going to be a day. It's not going to be a week. It's going to be for the rest of your life to supply this individual with all that you have so that they can carry on to the next generation and they can pass on this EK that is so valuable. And I guess if there are questions or, you know, if anything that anybody wants to share that what both Kipo and I have shared, we are, you know, we're here to answer or hear your mana'o too as well. He and I are like, you know, the admiration society. We like you. <laughs> Mutual ad admiration. Uh, I see that there's some mother. comments, but you know. Oh, that's mostly me and Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll turn it back to, I don't know, Colina, Amber, if you had anything you want to facilitate. Otherwise, you know me, I'm good at talking forever. It can easily continue, but I definitely want to open it up to. Everyone else who's joined us today, um, <laughs> yeah. If anything, anybody else wants to share your questions? Or, you know. I have a question. I have a question. Hi. Um. Thank you so much for everything that you shared, and it's always an honor when people share about their families. I want to compliment Keone on the killer background that he has behind him for Zoom. <laughs> Keone has got the got the gold medal today. Um, you know, the things that you shared is so important, but my question is a lot of the places we have problems are in places where that generational journey has been broken, especially in urban areas where a lot of help is needed. And yet when they stand up and help in that journey, sometimes they're criticized for not being from that part of the island or from that place. Um, Kaleo, could you comment on that? And then Kipo, Kipo oh, please, thank you. Yes, you know, it's funny when people say, oh, you're not from that place, right? Kipo'o was not born in South Kona. And yet his connection is very strong there because he has a relationship with place. In Ka'u, I have connections back to Ka'u, but I had to field people telling me, but you weren't born there, so you don't belong. And I said, you know, that's very divisive. Because who knows who is going to be that leader that's going to come and uplift the Lahui, to uplift. Yes, places are no longer, the connection might be broken for a certain place, but that does, shouldn't stop you from going back to those places that you feel, that you feel in your na'au belongs to you, because only you can feel that, not someone else telling you your genealogy. Yeah, I went to Hana and um, we had a Lua class there. So I, I went to Hana and I was there and I was overwhelmed by visiting this one place and I knew I belonged there. I didn't know the history, I didn't know, but I knew I belonged there because there was a relationship there that was long ago and I was able to connect centuries later to this one place. So. I think that we as Hawaiians need to educate our lahui to say, don't make your genealogy the basis for exclusion. Make that the basis for inclusion. Try to seek out who else might be related to you. Distantly does not matter, but help them to see that keeping it so tight to you to say, Hey, if you weren't born there, you don't belong. Or, you know, your family wasn't there for generations, you don't belong. Because that separates our lahui and makes them into little pockets. If we're going to move forward, we need to meld all of us together and say we are one. We are one ohana. That is what moves us forward. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not, but. Yeah, I've got something to add on that. To and if you don't mind, Mahalo for the question. It, it's a very good question, and I feel there's there's a um, it's a tricky one. 
I think in like real like anti um not only is excellent and in executing that is probably one of the biggest challenges as well because it's to like our mobile how shouldn't be the reason for exclusion but the reason for inclusion at the same time we need to acknowledge how we try to include our, ourselves or how we approach so as she mentioned my I'm not born in South Kona I have ties out there as well and I, I think back to when um we did we, we had the um had the privilege of going back to South Kona for one of our programs in 2018 and when we opened up then we went with some of our ohana um, they did ceremony to welcome, you know, our Haumana, our staff into the area. And we're over there at Kapu Kapu, our people know the area as Kealakikua Bay. And so they stood on one side facing us doing the, you know, Komo and whatnot, or, you know, welcoming us in. And then I stood with our Haumana as we, you know, request permission. And afterwards, when my, my cousin tells me, like, it's like, oh, you know, you should have been standing over here with us. Just saying, like, you know, he's acknowledging me that, I'm from that place and we were standing in the area from which like my name all comes from a very specific place in that day. There's, there's Kuliana tied to that place. And so, yeah, I know what, you know, if you want to call it the obligations or rights that I have in my um, connection to that place at the same time, I felt it important to demonstrate for the Haumana different ways that you interact with places. Even if you have these connections, you're not always entitled to the same level of koleana per se and so that was me acknowledging that yes i have a koleana here but i have not been here in years i haven't been here day to day in the same way that a lot of the other people have been there um do i come with different types of cultural knowledge do i come with academic knowledge and, and ways to um do things that maybe they weren't utilizing as much of sure but then it was for me to also recognize my place in that like well it doesn't mean I just come in here and steamroll and just be like, hey, everyone, I've got this. So just like be amazed and in wonder, and like, let me come and be the savior, or, you know, whatever kind of deal. But to, you know, acknowledge the Ohana who have remained there and find how I fall in line with all of that and see that as uh, a constant challenge in so many different areas, especially where Aina is concerned and especially where Ibi Kupuna is concerned. It's a constant tension or disagreement even among families when they're engaged in consultation and whatnot. And we're like, oh, who are you? Where do you come from? You, you haven't been involved with this for how long? What are you, what are you doing here? What, how do you belong here? But then it's, how do we know they don't belong there? Two, genealogies are so intricate, intertwined. They go, they go back so many different generations. I doubt any single person alive um, knows all the genealogies so well that you can proclaim um, very definitively that someone is not related to you. We have all the evidence to show otherwise that like we have so many different ways that we are related, right? There's haloa, we say like, everybody traces back to umi and whatnot. So we're all ohana and like, how closely knit are we? Like, we, we, are we that, that same kalo that's on the same oha or maybe we're from the, the next patch over, you know, but we are so related. Um, yeah, mahalo me for that question. So you can find out there. Any others or, or your, your own one or two? And NT and I are like the panelists, but it doesn't mean like we're, yes. we're the only ones who can sit on the soapbox and, and talk. Yep. To we love to hear Manao from others as well. And I think that's where Kipo and I um, see things very similarly is that what we know, what we have, is not the only thing or the only truth. We, we really love to hear other people's. Manao as well, because we need all of us in this canoe to move forward. And um, sometimes we may be blindsided by ideas that we have held so dear, and now it's disproven, and we're sort of like a, a canoe going in the ocean in no direction. And then somebody comes and tells us something and go, oh, I okay, now that makes sense. And now I'm back, you know, on, on course. So yeah, if anybody wants to share, we would really appreciate it. Otherwise, Kipo and I can just keep on talking and talking and talking. <laughs> we have yeah, so many, true, many, right? many have stories. At least three or four more points. Yeah, yeah, we have lots of stories, you know. And um, um, in fact, one of you know, um, one of the things that grind, uh, grounds me—not grinds me—I'm thinking of coffee now. 
But one of the things that grounds me is the strength in knowing I have a connection to my grandmother and great grandmother who I've never met. How is that possible? Of course it's possible because as Hawaiians, we practice intergenerational uh, flow of knowledge. You just have to be open to hear and understand it. That's all it is. They have been my guiding force from the time I was a baby. I didn't know who they were at the time, but I could feel them, sense them. If I was in trouble, they would send me a sign and I would be steered clear. You know, walking down the street, most people look both sides, yeah, look the road, okay, make sure no cars are coming. You will find me a lot of times walking across the street without looking. One of these days I'm gonna get hit because they're gonna teach me a lesson. But it's that assurance that I know that they are watching out for me and nothing can happen to me until it is my time to hala. And it's that self-confidence that I have that I don't know how to explain except to say that they're watching my back. They tried me, they scold me, they put me on the right path. Sometimes when I'm, you know, especially my tutu, was my great grandmother, um, you know, she's very stern. And yet there's my grandmother who's very soft and very, um, and they all have their different personalities. But in doing this kuleana, in doing malama kupuna, you must find that one in your background, that one that has your back. That's the one that will guide you through your life. And you can depend on them. And what they say cannot be refuted. People, I don't know if people understand the term, the knowing, K-N-O-W-I-N-G. When I have that, it's a flash. It's just a thought and says, okay. When I have that, I have 100% sure it is accurate and correct. I do not question, I do. When you experience that, you will know what I mean, the knowing. And that comes from them signaling to you, you are to do this, end of story. And you just do it. And you will find that that was the correct path. So remember always to lean on them. But... Also, at the same time, the work is in your hands. The pow, the only guiding, giving you help. But the work is in our hands and it's up to us to make sure the work gets done. Yeah? So when we holla out, we can do the same to our next generation and say, okay, I'm up here, you folks down there, you folks do the work. But, but it's very, very sad when people feel that they cannot go to these places anymore. Yeah. I don't want these places to be a memory for our, our Lahui. I want them to still be alive, to be, still be relevant to us. And that is the job that we have as this collective, to have as the future generations, is to make sure that we are going to provide these bahikupuna so that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, it'll be there. And we can actually say and go there, pay our respects. Yeah. But it doesn't happen in the void, it happens through continuum. We have to build those relationships. And as I said, once you're familiar with somebody, very, very hard to do harm to them, yeah? Once you know you ohana, kind of hard to do harm to them. Same thing with the aina. Once you're familiar and build a relationship with the ohana, hard to do damage. Yeah? That's what we have to do. We have to go to the private landowners, and build a relationship so that we are not faceless people in the background, that we are people who care about the land that you have purchased and we would like to help you, Malama.
And that's going to be the challenge that we face. Mahalo, well, Auntie. I kind of want to tack on to that too. Is, and onto the other mana that you shared earlier. You know, like, yeah, you know, this, this is our kulana Or when you know it, then you, you'll know that it's your turn to take this on. And then first, I was thinking like, don't be intimidated by that, but that's really unrealistic. It is intimidating. But know how to deal with it and overcome that as intimidating efforts kupuna to guide you, they'll help you. And also don't, um, no shame, I guess is one thing I was thinking of, like how I did brought up earlier, talking about generations that were discouraged from being Hawaiian and Moana. There's, there's many historical facts and reasons why um, we are in the situation that we're in today in so many different ways. And that uh, um, a lot of us maybe have shame around too and thinking like, oh, I don't know my language too well. Well, how come we don't know our language? So there was an overthrow that happened in 1893, right? 1896, that those people who took over put in different policies that made it very difficult, punishable through, you know, physical beating and whatnot for speaking any other language besides English in the schools. And so people were discouraged from that. My mom shared um, experiences of hearing her grandparents talking in little Hawaii and they didn't realize that she was listening and she got really excited and she said oh my gosh are you speaking Hawaiian I want to learn Hawaiian and they turned to her and um had this like very sad look on their face like no no baby you, you go learn to speak American I right? didn't say English you, you learn to speak American because of their own lived experience they felt that shame around it they felt that like, it would be more beneficial for her to learn the English language as spoken by the American government currently in power. And so there's all these things that stack against us. Um, I want to tap onto that too, it's like it's never too late, which I really, really appreciate. And I take that to heart so much too. Like some people say, I look young and everything. I'm not really that young. And um, it's something I'm like really self-conscious about in different ways and, and being in school and thinking like, oh my gosh, I see all these other people going through and they're so much younger and like maybe ahead of me as far as getting degrees and whatnot. But there's a reason I'm in this position at the time that I'm in. And I, it's definitely something I constantly struggle with, but realize like, hey, you know, no shame about that. We're, we're here at the time that we're meant to be. And um, I'm really thankful for that and, and encouraged by the younger ones who are able to find themselves along this path at an earlier age, which is wonderful. This is what we should be striving towards. And um, something else, that Auntie mentioned too about, uh, you know, when she mentioned about those who think that they might not be worthy. Um, I'm glad this is recorded too. This is something I see uh, in some of our homana that come through the Bahi Kukuna Internship Program sometimes and others. And so this is to say directly to you is to, you know, not be afraid and ashamed to excel, um, to do your best. Um, and so what am, what am I getting at here is like a lot of times you look to examples of our kupuna, like scholars like Kamakao and whatnot, and we tend to revere them as some kind of high bar of expectation that we always strive to meet, but we can never exceed. And what I say is like, I think they want us to succeed. We always want to succeed and to exceed. They always want us to do better. And it can get intimidating when we try and think, well, what does that mean? to exceed them like, oh my gosh, maybe my Olelo Hawaii will never be as great as Kamakao or their writing, or I don't know, all these different kind of things. Well, they were raised a lot differently than we are. As Auntie mentions, the challenges of today are different than they were before. And so exceeding today, I feel means like, how do we tackle and address the changes that we are faced with now? And they say, how do we use the tools that we have available to us now to ensure that things are better later on? As she mentioned, how do we, we prevent future generations from having to do all the same things over again? So a lot of us are faced with the challenge of relearning the language. How, is there other things we can do for the next generation so that they will learn the language? So like when I have kids, I'm gonna force them to speak Olelo Hawaii. And I'm kidding, I'm not gonna force them to do anything. Um, <laughs> but you know, there will be more opportunities available for them to have the option. Um, and where, where else was I going with this rant? Um, yeah, it's, it's like, to not, not be ashamed of that. Don't be afraid to step into positions as we can. And we do. Again, I'm so stoked to see Amber and Kalana who were Haumana before now. They are colleagues, leaders in their own right. Garhui. And um, so I can see more stepping into that and finding ways that we can transmit this. And again, Auntie Mahalo for sharing that. Finding that one 
to transmit whatever you have learned, as she said, like you're supposed to know a lot of things. Um, and Amber and Kalana have heard this from me so many times before. I always tend to use this metaphor of um, Vite. Uh, as that of Ike and as that of ourselves with different generations and whatnot too. And so by that model, when we think about transmitting whatever it is that we know or more like what we learn, think about water as a metaphor for knowledge. Where knowledge is like water, Ike is like water, right? And for time, it is held in different vessels to in different people. It's held within the Aina in different ways. And so a lot of times maybe we are that vessel right, that receives by from whatever sources that by comes from. But we know that by is always more valuable. It does more to ho'ola when it is transferred, right? When that by goes to feed a person, when that by goes to feed an aina, um, it is not as useful when it just remains within one vessel alone or one place and becomes stagnant. Not that it cannot be more valuable later on, but it, it is that transmission that is the most valuable thing. And so I, I think that's very useful when we think about this and we think of identifying those to transmit knowledge because we might look at ourselves and be like, who, who do I presume myself to be, to be this all knowledgeable person that I can like, you know, have here, young one, receive my knowledge. And, you know, I, I personally, that's kind of like how, how I see myself. I don't view myself of having any kind of kulana like that too. But I think we view the metaphor that way. And it's like, well, it's not about me. It's about all of us. And he said, this is the Ike we've received from others. It doesn't necessarily belong to us, but we're just holding it right now. And then find ways to anai, anai of truth. Mahalo, stop ranting. It's joyful ranting. It's a sharing of knowledge. And, and that's what our kupuna did for us too, you know, they sat us down and we were supposed to listen. We weren't supposed to take part. We were supposed to listen. And in that listening, we gained knowledge that we didn't know then, but later on it comes back and then it goes, aha, I know why. Because some of the stories the kupuna used to say, oh my goodness, yeah, there was some, um, very interesting, but you weren't supposed to say a word, right? You're just supposed to listen. But inside you're going, oh my, 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 I've got, I, I, I got to share this, right? But no, it's supposed to sit there for a while until you are ready. Right? You're mature enough to absorb the full comprehension of what they were saying. And, you know, um, there are many leaders that are coming up. And I'm so, so thankful. You know, I look around just in the just in the who's here today and I see leaders there. I see Hawaiians who have risen above. They are the likes of Kamakau, Kepalino, you know, Papai'i. They are not in the same venue, but they are. And I think we need to start recognizing and acknowledging that this coming generation has some rising stars that are just going to make the history books or not, doesn't matter, but let us not disregard because someone has the pala pala that they don't have the knowledge because sometimes that's what we do. We, we acknowledge, I don't think of Kepo'o as a PhD candidate, he's Kepo'o, you know, we talk, he don't talk to me as though he's the doctor, Kili Pakawa. He's talking to me as auntie. And that's what we need to share with each other. And that's what I see in some of those that are here in the conversation today is that they are those future leaders and they are going to need all of us. They're gonna need all of us so that they can succeed and that they will lift the Lahui so that we can connect back to our places, take care of our places, uh, take care of each other, help steward, help to bring the lahui into a more cohesive means. This also will mean that we as a lahui need to support those who are taking action. 
and doing it without rioting, without doing it, but they're doing it by appealing to common sense and rational thought. Because, well, you know what they say, yeah? Vinegar, sugar catches more flies than vinegar. So that's a tool to use. If, as long as we can continue doing this. I'm not saying don't fight. Oh, trust me, I'm a, I'm a battle warrior. I fight. But there's a time to bring your ihe out. And there's a time to bring your staff of lono out. And now is a great time to bring our lono out to kuka and to make policy, to make stewardship units around the paiaina so that as a collective, we cannot be beat. Yeah, we'll have a force to be reckoned with. And that's kind of like, I don't know, we maybe jumped around to so many different, you know, conversations throughout this hour and a half, but I do know that, you know, our time is getting close to pau, but, um, you know, I don't know, Kepo, do you have any last words? Oh, mahalo no you again. Oh, no, Auntie. You put it in. Oh, oh yeah, Kepo. No, okay. No, just mahalo nui again for um, taking the time to be here with us this morning um, and just sharing about your ohana, your experiences, and your pilina with each other and with Vahikupuna. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kalena, who will be um, closing us out this morning. No, um, mahalo, Amber. Yeah, just just wanted to say mahalo to each of you folks for for. Um, taking the time to be here in this um, space with us and um, I just keep thinking like throughout the whole time um, Kipo all you're talking Auntie Kaleo you're talking it just like you know what better way to spend your Saturday morning than to um, sit in this space and really become regrounded with familiar stories you know I think about um, we each carry and how Auntie said we're journeying through the generations we're journeying through our own um, mo'olelos that we're um, creating and um, and in that way you know we're, we're um, being able to kind of sit in this space and experience one another and as auntie says life is just a bunch of accumulated experiences and no one experiences is the same but what is beautiful is that um, today we get to walk away with this shared experience and the familiarity that we now have with Kepo'o and Auntie Kaleo and the way that we can bring that back and ground it in our own work and our own um, in our own lives in a very intimate way um, in a way to move forward yeah so um, I just think of of this time as just being able to fill up our cups fill up our apu um, with with um, all these new enrichments and um, yeah so just mahalo to each of you folks for sharing um, for being here with us taking the time and a big mahalo to Kipo'o and Auntie Kaleo for um, just really you know talking stories and that's really where we we learn the richness um, and feel inspired is just by stripping things back and getting to the root of who we are and um, understanding how to really journey through our own mo'olelo and our own lives. Um, so I know Amber dropped in the chat um, a link to our survey, our post survey. And um, we would really, really appreciate you folks taking the time to fill it out really short. And um, really just to get some mana'o about um, a, a space for you folks to share mana'o. Cause I know, um, you know, if you don't wanna share it vocally out loud now, um, that post survey is a way for you folks to kind of leave some mana'o for us to kind of reflect on. And um, I feel like I had one more thing. Oh yeah, one more thing was, don't forget we have Ha'avina. Auntie Kaleo said, when we leave this time together, we gotta go back and think about the one person that in our lives who we would share and pass on what we what we learn. And um, also our other Ha'avina is to then go back and remember the one kupuna or the one kumu or the one person in our life that we can lean on, yeah? So um, I hope you folks walk away from today's um, session um, with these new enrichments and inspirations to really, again, kind of um, re-familiarize yourself with where you ground yourself. Um, think about the kupuna you lean on 
and think about um, the keiki or the person that um, you would pass on all this ike to. Um, so if anybody else has any closing mana'o, um, that is kind of concludes our session. And again, just mahalo for joining us um, this Saturday morning. <laughs> Oh, um, Kalamai, I would like to also add, we will be having um, another um, um, presentation um, in this series. Um, so um, when you fill out our post survey, you can be added to our email list and we will send out uh, more information regarding those next presentations. Yeah, but other than that, Oya Vale, Mahalo. Mahalo Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Aloha, everyone. Thanks for coming. Ooh, that was so good.